Hi, I'm James McGuire, and on today's Tech Voices, we're talking about artificial intelligence and data, including how to get the most in your AI software using your own data. To discuss that, I'm joined by Daniel Evansini, Chief Data Officer at NDCM, an AI and data consultancy. Daniel, very good to talk with you today. Very good to talk to you, James. So I think, you know, companies can sometimes be confused about using their own data you know, using proprietary data to drive your own AI deployment, it's, it's sort of a little understood by companies. How can companies get started with this kind of a thing? Yeah, sure. Um, of course, most most companies understand that AI LLMs are based on text, right, or, or images, but let's say 90% text. Uh, and then you kind of, uh, you, maybe you're confused, like, where's data? Where's data in, the, in this picture, right? Right, um, right. There are a few ways, a few, a few uh, ways to think about data with with AI. Well, I'll say Gen AI, the more like the modern way of uh, of, of seeing AI, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Because of course, when you look about AI in general, you you can talk about machine learning, uh, a lot of the traditional uh, use cases of AI, which are data intensive. So these, the, I think, these are more understood. For, mm -hmm. from, for companies. When we are talking about LLMs, foundational models, etc., uh, there is, of course, um, uh, an understanding that data is not only uh, spreadsheets and tables, includes text, so everything's data. So if, we, if you look in a broader sense, when we are using text, or un, we, are calling, we usually call it unstructured data, so it's, it's still data, right? Okay. Um, and you can, for instance, use uh, rag mod, uh, rag approaches, which is very common these days. But you, you have you structure your data in a way that it's easier to search and to retrieve, right? Retrieve or augmented generation. And, and so by, by the way, just way for, for the, sorry to interrupt. For those who don't know, rag retrieval augmented generation. Yes, that's the <laughs> that's the the let's say the long form yes thank of, you right which is the probably the more common way people are using uh, gen ai in, in uh, companies right now so it's right. really it's you're not training a model as people like to 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 to, to, to say but you are uh, using the models to search and to have a natural language interaction with your data right this is one way right okay. so when you have a chatbot for instance and you ask how much did i sell less month as a company you usually you are structuring that you're structuring the the data in a tabular way in a table in a spreadsheet in uh then you when you, you ask the llm for instance it converts your question into a a query gets the data back and converts the result into a natural language response mm -hmm. so it, it's not a let's say a native uh the model it doesn't really is not really going there for the data. It's just formatting the queries. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is one way you can use your data. Uh, there are more advanced use cases where you actually train a model, or you post train a model with your proprietary data, which mm -hmm. is also uh, it's I would say less common. It's, it's harder to do. You need a you need a, a more advanced team, a more advanced technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, but for some use cases, that could work. So if you have lots of proprietary data, for instance, you can kind of build your own model. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one way, one place people are doing that is, for instance, medical medical use cases that are more sensitive and you need specific results. So mm -hmm. people are using data on top of foundational models to build medical-specific uh, uh, use cases. Mm -hmm. Well, I think some companies are worried, though, if they if they you know put their data into a large language model, it will be used to train that model. But who knows? They're they're concerned, like, well, where where else is it going to go? Is it is my data going to leak outside the parameters of, of of the enterprise? Is is that is that an issue? Like, I should, you know, we should be worried about putting our data into a into a large language model. Um, depends. So it depends. If you're working with one of the enterprise companies and you're paying for this. Uh, you shouldn't be worried. So if you're working with uh, maybe like an enterprise license of, of Gemini or Anthropic or, or OpenAI, 
they explicitly say they are not using your data for, to train their models. Mm -hmm. So if they do that, then there's a legal problem because they're right. uh, in violation of their of their terms, right? So if you're using enterprise licenses, that shouldn't be shouldn't be a concern. Okay. But I think mo uh, many companies that are more afraid of using AI actually are kind of creating a problem for themselves because their employees are using AI right. without a license and right. then they are incurring this risk. Sh so, shadow AI it's sometimes called. It's the shadow AI, is that exactly. So, yeah. so actually it's kind of the reverse thing uh, of what the IT departments are thinking like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna block AI because I don't, I'm, I don't wanna incur the risk of losing my data to be trained in a model, but then there's a shadow AI and people are actually using the wrong way, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And there's just another way if you're really, really worried and maybe even the terms are not okay and not enough, maybe you are, you know, let's say a bank and you have a very specific regulations, you can use open models, open weight models it's called, mm -hmm. and you can build the model inside your own infrastructure and then you're, you're, you can be sure that, that there's no data going in or out of the model uh, to another provider, which is some companies are doing that also. You know, on, on a related note, I think just about the, the nature of large language models these days, you know, there are now so many large language models that a company can, can choose from. There's, I don't know, hundreds, maybe thousands. Um, Certainly as many. And I, so do you think the large language models are becoming commodified? I mean, there used to be this rarefied, you know, odd thing. And now it's like, there's, there's thousands of them. Are, are, is the large language model now a commodity out in the, in the IT enterprise market? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, and yes, I would say so, because then it, go, it all comes back to the data. So still most, most models use the same data. Uh-huh. Okay. Right. So it's the it's the web data, it's open like public data, and there are some uh, famous data sets like uh, Open Crawl, etc. Some Common Crawl is a famous one. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 even in traditional machine learning, people used to say that the it, the, the algorithm is not the hard part; is not the proprietary part. The, the data is like mm -hmm. everyone can use the same algorithm. Right. right. So this is a similar problem. Like if you if you have the same data, the challenge is really having the enough computing power and talent to build uh, the model because the technologies kind of everyone knows the models, the 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 frameworks are public. A lot of them are open, mm -hmm. so they're being published all the time, mm -hmm. and the data is also public. So it, it all comes down to having the data centers, the GPUs, uh, enough GPUs to train your model. And then there are some specific things that people are doing to the like post training, et cetera. So, it, it's, so some models are still different from others. Mm -hmm. But because of the investment levels people are doing, uh, it kind of it converges uh, pretty fast. So right. I, I think there is, there is a, there is a, a a truth in saying that is is commoditized. Yeah. Interesting. So, all right. Well, let's let's talk about the the, the topic of data mesh. I mean, we, we know that a, a data mesh is a type of data architecture that enables decentralized data ownership. Very very fashionable these days. There are definitely there are clear advantages and you know easier access to data, less searching for users. But what are the challenges that companies need to be aware of? You know about data mesh and what about costs? Yeah, sure. So it, it was definitely very popular uh, a couple of years ago before AI became the the real the, the mm -hmm. thing. Are you think maybe it's fallen team. out of favor a little bit? Yeah, I mean it's still there, but mm -hmm. I think mm, a lot of the money is there is for AI right now. So it, it, you know all the foundational architectures are architectures are maybe not as popular because people just need to look at AI, it, it will come back and it still is, it still is there. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the challenge with, with data mesh, it's, it's a lot of on, on the culture and change management for, for, for companies because uh, you, when you decentralize, you need everyone to be working in a, so data mesh says like, it's going to be decentralized, but there's a federator, federated governments, federated uh, ways of working. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and now with AI, people are developing faster, and but maybe not as standardized because you can call the agents and like you need your own guardrails to make sure that you're building the right way. Not everyone is doing that. So mm -hmm. sometimes it becomes uh, kind of a data mess, what people mm. say sometimes. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Data mesh can become a data mess. <laughs> All right. Um, and it's also, there's, there's uh, so you're talking about cost. Um, depends of how you do it. There's a lot of duplication of, of effort. So um, so maybe you have a, you know, I don't know, database. Every team has its own database, has its own infrastructure. And that, you know, that doubles the cost or triples the cost. Mm -hmm. So there are ways of doing it in a more cost efficient way. There are better ways of doing it, but I don't know. I don't, I don't think everyone knows how to do this. And mm -hmm. also one of the problems of data mesh that it's highly conceptual. So when you look into the original publications and books and et cetera, it doesn't tell you how to do it. It tells you why. Ah, okay. Right? Uh, why should you have a data mesh? So, when we talk, when I talk to companies, a lot of them are like, yeah, we're implementing a data mesh, but they don't know how to do it. Everyone's trying to do it, you know? Interesting. Huh. So uh, that's why it, it's still like, uh, it's not something that some consultancy is bringing in it. Like it, that's it, you know? Right. There are different ways of doing it. So it's, it's high conceptual, but I, I definitely think it's, it's a good approach if you do it right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about um, data and AI I mean, and, and, and kind of the future in the sense of where we're going. I think about Henley data has always been a major challenge for companies. I mean, will there come a time, you know, in the next few years or whenever when AI makes this friction free, when actually AI makes handling data far easier? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. And I think it is. It is already. Um, what, what AI is, is helping is bringing analysts, people who are more like business focused, business savvy, they can access more complex technology uh, that are necessary to query, to operate big data, which is what most companies have right now, without the requiring of understanding the complex logic or programming languages, a lot of this stuff that you needed a couple of years ago. So like, like, like for us, you know, our team knows how to do that in a more technical way. And now it's kind of easier for our clients to do the same mm -hmm. or to operate in a similar way. Hmm. So that opens up a much larger community of data users that, um, that would be probably possible without AI, right? Because you can't really upskill or reskill thousands of people to be using Python or SQL queries, all these, these right. technologies that data understands. Yeah, right? right. So, you know, it's easier when you're younger, but when you have 20 years of experience, it's harder. But with AI, you can do it, right? You can ask AI and the AI does it for you. Hmm. At the same time, uh, when we are talking about data mesh, so there's still there's still a big problem because the the platforms, the data quality, everything has to be there. It has to be there because mm -hmm. AI does not fix right. data quality problems, especially right. when it comes all the way from the source. So um, I think it it will uh, enable a lot of people to work with AI, who, with data in in general mm -hmm. in, the, in the next few years. Yeah, but it will require an even larger investment in data quality, data governance that companies were inclined to do in the past five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people in the industry is talking about this is like AI requires more investment in governance and platforms, right. at least in the first phase. Um, and it's not a magic, a silver bullet for fixing your data problems. It's definitely uh, an enabler of consumption of data. Right. It, it actually makes a lot of the work cheaper also and more efficient because, it, it, you know, it makes developing more efficient. So in that sense, yes, but it still, it still requires uh, the knowledge of data engineering, of data-specific uh, work to build these platforms 
and these pipelines and everything that is necessary to enable the consum the consumption in the mm -hmm. It makes perfect sense. Um, yeah. Daniel, I think you said it, a lot of good stuff. Uh, it's gonna be an interesting sector to watch, to be sure, like the relationship between data and AI, very rapidly evolving. Um, thanks for your thoughts and please come back and talk with us again sometime. Yeah, thank you, James. Thank you, James, and exciting times for, for working the data space.